turns strong along the Atlantic coast. Overnight lows of 4 to 7 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Football Show on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. Fake crowd noise. The Emirates never sounded so good. Gamble responsibly. See I'm prepared to anything I can. Well, do it then. Again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should there be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. And can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? It is still one of the great questions of our time. You're welcome along to Thursday's football show. Nathan with you until 10 o'clock. We've got a busy weekend of football ahead on off the ball, of course. Two live games coming your way on Sunday, starting with Southampton against Everton. That is an Everton side who'll be without Seamus Coleman out for the next two, three weeks, Carlo Ancelotti says, with a hamstring injury. And also probably without the rather wonderful James Rodriguez. But that's underway at 2 o'clock with Bernard O'Toole and Kenny Cunningham. And then Stephen Doyle and Ruth Fahey will bring you through Wolves against Newcastle from half past four. As always, on Saturday afternoon, Dan and Johnny will be here alongside Neil and keep you up to date with all the goings on. But there's a lot going on at the moment as well in the Europa League. Thursday night football, well, some people are perfectly happy to have it. Uh, Dundalk are certainly happy to be there, but a frustrating night for them. They did make that dream start against Molda. 1-0 in front, 10 minutes before halftime, when Sean Murray headed in yet again. However, they conceded twice in the second half out in Tala. So Dundalk beaten 2-1 in their opening game in, in Group B. We will talk to their coach, Shane Keegan, a little bit later in the hour. Dundalk go to the Emirates next Thursday night to take on Arsenal. And Arsenal started with a 2-1 win against Rapid Vienna. They went behind as well early in the second half. But late goals from David Luiz and Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang mean that Arsenal start with a victory. And a great start for Rangers. 2-0 winners against Standard Liège. I mentioned it. If you're online, go check out Khmer Roof's goal in injury time from the halfway line after getting around about four or five different players. But that's a big, big win for Steven Gerrard's side. Plenty of more Europa League action ongoing. Celtic 2-0 down. They've been really poor. They made two changes at the break against AC Milan. That one at Celtic Park. It's been quite straightforward for Leicester City against Zoria. They're 2-0 up at halftime, goals from Madison and Barnes. And Spurs, with Matt Doherty in the starting eleven, are 2-0 up in their game against Lask. Uh, the goal there coming, uh, there was an own goal in that match and also a goal for Lucas Moore. It's a much changed uh, Tottenham side. No Harry Kane or no Young Min Son in the starting eleven. but Garth Bale has made his first start at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium to chat about that and much more besides on the busy week of European action. David Myler is with us. Evening, David. Nathan, how are you? I'm hanging in there. You got a big old smile on your face. What is you so happy of a Thursday evening? <laughs> no, it's just uh, I always find it funny when obviously the bulletin starts before you come on. It's uh, Paul Gascoigne. <laughs> it was a lively start to the game, and then he does the e. <laughs> Catches me every time. You need That's something good. like that. If you if you could do something a little bit out of the ordinary, we'll stick you in the intro. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just, it's just it just sums Gascoigne up, doesn't it? It's just the type of fella he was, the character he was. It's just, I don't know. It must be what 20, 20 years old. No, it's longer than twenty years old. Um, yeah, I think it's, is. is it ninety seven, ninety eight? It's probably around that, just after Euro ninety six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is he? I was so going to say, cool. is he the only former Rangers player that Irish people really like? But Ali McCoist, people like Ali McCoist, don't they? People yeah, like I like Ali McCoist. Yeah, people yeah like I listen. I listen to Ali McCoist every now and then on the radio in the mornings. Um, well, he's not he's on OTB AM, so I don't know where you'd hear him, David. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that, so I just said on the radio. But I do hear Ali, and I don't mind Ali. And then, if you remember, he was on, you know, Question of Sport, and uh, I think that's where kind of people grew the fondness of him. Mm. So. We'll talk mostly about Champions League, but I guess when you're talking Champions League, you're going back to Liverpool, you're going back to Virgil van Dijk again. Uh, I felt the second I saw that collision with Pickford, I went, oh no, this is one of those oh, moments. Yeah. The way the leg straightens up, this is going to be played in the montage at the end of the season. This could well be the defining moment when Virgil van Dijk picks up an injury, and it is as bad as everybody feared. It looks highly unlikely he's going to play again this season. Are you looking at this as absolute disaster for Liverpool? Because this is the equivalent of like this is the equivalent of United losing Ronaldo or Rooney at their peak for the season. It is look, it's a it's a massive loss. Um he's probably the best centre half in the world at the moment. Obviously there's always arguments is he the best? Um but he is a huge blow for Liverpool. Um he's a massive loss. He's such a, an iconic you know, figure in that in that back four. He's been instrumental since he signed. You know, he's been 
pivotal to the success they've had in the Champions League and then going on to win the Premier League. So he is a big loss, but unfortunately, you know, teams do lose players. Um, it's, it's it's a bad injury to get. Um, but look, he's got he's at Liverpool, one of the biggest clubs in the world. He'll have the support, you know, the medical staff. He'll have everything, you know, catered for him. Um, I've no doubt about that. And I, look, it's just. It's just such a long time for him to be out, and it'll probably end up being, you know, what do we know, um, October, which is, you know, it's probably be you're looking at next summer by the time he's to return to football. Um, so that's it's obviously a major blow. So, look, Liverpool just have to get on with it, and I think they started that, you know, with the performance against Ajax. You, your injury, your knee, and, and you've had quite a few of them. Mm. Did you have the exact same injury as Van Dijk? Um, my second one was... Obviously, look, we will never know the ins and outs of what happened to Virgil. Mm. Um, that will be kept behind closed doors. Unless you're very close with Virgil, you'll never... Like the conversation between the manager, the doctor, the surgeon, you know, whoever takes the scan and Virgil himself, you'll never know the ins and outs of it. We know it's a, an ACL. Um, my second injury was a straight ACL. My first one was a lot more than just my ACL. Um so I've been there, I've been in that road where it's it's tough. You have to, you know, look, there's no doubting he'll be able to get back from it. There's, there's not, look, it's not like 1980s where, you know, that injury would have finished you. Mm. Um, there's so much medical staff and surgeons who can, you know, cut you open and fix you up. Um, I've no doubt that he'll be back, but it's just for him, he needs to wrap, wrap his head around the mental challenge of, I'm out for this significant period. What do I need to do? And then... There will be days when he'll feel like, you know, there's no light at the end of the tunnel when, you know, you're you're sore, you're stiff, you have to get up and you have to motivate yourself. If the lads, the Liverpool players have a big game coming up on the weekend, it's, you know, a game that you want to be a part of where it's, you know, a special European night that you want to be a part of. There will be moments when it's tough, but, you know, he just needs to, look, I'm sure he'll, he'll be fine. He'll keep the head down, he'll work hard, and, you know, he'll be back. So what are the factors then, because you're probably, unfortunately, as, as much of an expert as anybody on these type of yeah. knee injuries, you had so many of them down through the years, what are the factors that go from it being a five to six month to being a nine to ten month to a year out? What, what, what are, do you know that quite early in, into the injury as to how long it's going to be? Um, it's very hard to, you know, to say. Look, they always say that's why it's such an open blanket with it's a six to nine month. Mm. Um, like I said, we don't know the the full extent. Like there's smallest things. Is it a straight tear at the ACL? Is it like a rip on the ACL? Like both will need major surgery, which will both take significant time. Sometimes a straight tear, a clean tear, is better than a rip in it. Um, I'm not. I'm not a medical. I'm not a doctor, so I can't like. I can only talk about my own experiences. Yeah. But then it's just a case of. How's the swelling? How soon can he get surgery? Does he, like, I presume he'll need surgery. Um, how long does he have to wait? Is it a case of, does the swelling need to come down before surgery or can they just operate straight away? Like with both mine, I went straight in with bundles of swelling. I just had to go straight in for surgery because I was that bad. Um, so then it's getting that. And then once that gets done, it's kind of like, you might stay in hospital for a day or two. Obviously, there's there's always the risk of infection. Um and then, please God, fingers crossed that there's no infection or anything. And then it's just a case of there'll be a straightforward plan of he'll probably partial weight bear for four to six weeks, back on crutches where you're putting you know your weight through your body. He'll be into a swimming pool, building his muscles up, probably do a lot of upper body weights, stuff like that. And then it will be how how can we you know get the get the knee moving, kind of get it back to normality. And then it's just you'll have a structure in place of every probably four to six weeks she'll probably advance on another level um you'd probably expect them to be back outside in five six months or something doing very very light work you know out in a pitch and then it's just a case of one how how quickly your body can heal and mm. adapt to everything that's going on because every step you're actually increasing your load so that putting that demand on your knee it is tough like if you look at you know oxlin chamberlain had something where it didn't exactly work out straight away where he had a little minor setback. So please call Virgil is none of that. And it's just a straightforward, you know, ACL uh, repair and, you know, the rehab is straightforward. What about the mental side of it then and coming to terms with the fact you're not going to be out on the pitch for 
six to nine months and your entire rhythm of life has suddenly changed completely. I think Virgil van Dijk is, yeah. like, he's, as you say, he's arguably the best defender in the world at the peak mm -hmm. of his powers. Like, there couldn't be a greater setback in terms of his career than what happened to him last weekend. How did you deal with maybe going through the stages of the initial shock, waiting for the surgery, and getting your head around the fact, oh, I'm not going to be back out in the pitch in nine months, and even then, like, how long is it going to take me to get fully back up to speed? How, how did you deal with that? <sighs> like, look, Virgil's married, he's got children. Um, I have the same agent, same football agent as Virgil. Um, I know all those people. Obviously, you've seen how much of a tight bond Liverpool are as a club. He'll have enormous amounts of support around him even i know there was a big you know piss take out of the i think it was the liverpool echo put out a thing if you want to send in your mm. you know get well soon messages for for virgil it was kind of a big hoorah but there'll be loads of people i think for virgil he just needs to sit down and kind of me personally everybody is different i've spoken to various different people who've had acls i set out goals for myself it was like every three weeks or four weeks i wanted to be at this stage um, people then questioned, well, what would happen to you if you weren't at that stage? And I kind of said, luckily enough, in my two cruciates, I was at each stage. I didn't, I didn't set myself goals that were not um, attainable. I could, I could achieve all of them as long as I worked hard. But look, it is tough, you know. Um, going into training, yeah, sure, you're, you're getting changed in the same changing room. You're with all the players. You're eating with the players. You're spending time with the players. Then they go out to train, and it's you're stuck in a gym. That's where like the medical staff are huge. Um, I always remember, you know, my time at Sunderland when I had mine, I had a physio, Dave Binningsley, who, who inevitably became my best friend. Um, we went through everything together. Like when I got good news from a surgeon, like he was always with me. He was the one that was there. When I got bad news from a surgeon saying maybe I couldn't join back into training, I'd have to wait another two to three weeks or, you know, I wasn't ready to play. He would say, blah, blah, blah. He was there with me the whole time. So, you you need you, well I said and I'm not going to say you need but he will have good people around him that will drive him on and then it's just not to lose focus of what what the end goal is um you know um do you want to be around doubt. do you want to be around the players because I, I remember Luke Fitzgerald the former Irish rugby player yeah, yeah, a few yeah. years back he had so many injury problems as well and mm. he was talking about trying to get that balance of like is there if I'm not going to be part of this for the next six months I don't want to be part of that rhythm of the week almost of the lads on a Friday are looking forward to the match and you're sitting there knowing that it's not for you and there's nothing you can do and you've got another six months of this that actually for your head and for actually the players because they don't want to see you sulking around the place either. They, were, were you around on a Friday still having lunch with everybody oh, as if uh, everything was fine? I, was, I completely get Luke Fitzgerald's point. Um, I've seen both sides of it. Lads go one way or they go the other way. Uh, there's kind of no in between. They either want to be watching training at games, going to games, or they just want to separate themselves to kind of focus. This is where I'm at, and when I return, I join the group again. Me personally, I used to work um, my work schedule. The the physio would come to me and said, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "Look, I want to watch training every day." And um, that was me. So I used to start at Sunderland at seven o'clock in the morning. I would be finished my morning session. By the time the players started training at half past 10, I would watch training. I would just sit down in a chair and watch the full session. And then I'd be back, I, like you'd go for lunch at one o'clock, but I'd start my afternoon session at two o'clock. And I did that every day. Um, went to every home game, away games I went to. Um, like Steve Bruce at the time was like, if you want to travel with the team, there's no problem. Um, and even so, I was given, a lot of the time I was given weekends off so I could work Monday to Friday. So I had, like basically I had time to, if I ever felt down or I could go home to Ireland to see my family. Um, like I was very lucky that they worked, they worked with me. Um, but I definitely loved watching training. I loved going to games. I wanted to be, I want to be part of it. Like at the, in my situation, it, it's very, very different in Virgil's because I had just broken into Sunderland's first team. Like I had played a handful of games. I think it was 10 or 11 in the Premier League. I played a couple in the FA Cup. And then I, I did my cruciate, so I was out, but then I wanted to be a part of it. And plus the fact I did mine on the 2nd of May in 2010. And it, it kind of came to the point where I had spent so long 
you know, training in the off season and, you know, the, the whole month of May, June, July, when lads were on their summer holidays, that when they kind of came back, that was my, that was my buzz and my lift of seeing the lads daily that they were in. And I was like, I wanted to stay a part of the group and I wanted to be training and show that I really did care about how the team was doing. And that, um, I was, I was just basically trying to do everything I could to get, you know, get myself fit to get, you know, try and get back into the team. Yeah. And did you need to check yourself to ensure that you were that positive influence around the place, that you weren't moping? Like maybe that's just not your your nature. No, anyways. no, no, there's no definitely there's definitely been days. There's definitely been days um I probably was a nightmare around the place. Um I remember like even a whole like and I had I don't know, was it me probably my fourth, fifth knee injury, like serious injury. I needed surgery. And I ended up having both knees operated on, and like I was, the physio was trying to get me to do work, and I had done so much rehabilitation on my knees that I was like, well, what's the point of me doing this exercise? And he was like, oh, just do the exercise. So I was like, well, no, it's not helping me benefit my knee. Um, so like there used to be an awful thing between two physios. Uh, Peachy was one of them, and Stuleek was the other, and they were like, I'm not dealing with him because I knew so much about my own knee and how to get my knee right that if they wanted me to do something that wasn't benefiting my knee, I refused to do it. That was if I was like in a bad mood or having an yeah. off day. Um, but yeah, look, you, you're you going to have bad days. That's normal. It's like any, you know, you can't, you can't be on top form every day. If you were, please send me, send me what you're reading or you're drinking because well, I'd love the, to well, be. But what are you reading and, and what, like, who are you talking to? Like, do the clubs think about that? Or are they saying, well, actually, here's a, you know, here's a guy in the peak of his career who's going to be six, nine months out. We want to make sure he is in a good mental headspace. Mm -hmm. Like, are, are there things in place that you have someone to talk to if, if there are issues? There are, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we had a fella, we had a fella at Hull, um, Mike the Psych was his name. Um, that's what we used to call him. But he was always around the place. He'd pop in to give kind of like, I wouldn't say motivational talks, but kind of talks to get your mind thinking. Um, and he was always about at Sunderland. There probably wasn't such a person, but like you're going back 10 years ago. Um, there was always, look, the manager, like I'd have to give great praise to Steve Bruce because he would always come in and check on you. Do you know, as the lads kind of went out of half as 10 to train, as I was kind of finishing my session to go out, he'd come and he'd walk out with me and he'd sit down and he'd talk to me while they were going through the, you know, the warm up. Yeah. And that must be huge. Not, yeah, of course. At the time I was, you know, 20 turning 21. Um, like you're young, you're kind of thinking like you kind of go over to England and you think, Oh God, I'm, I'm amazing. I'm unbelievable. I've made it. Um, this is me. This is me for life. Like, and then you kind of go over and it, you know, when you settle in, you think, geez, I'm at the bottom of the pile here. Like, you know, there's so many good players here at my age and I'm only at Sunderland. Never mind what Manchester United, Liverpool, Man City, Everton, Arsenal, Chelsea are all doing as well. And um, that was very difficult. And then you kind of, when you, when you overcome that challenge and you get into the first team and then you get a major setback, you, it, it's nice when a manager can, you know, put his arm around you and talk to you and just take that time to see how you are. And like, so many times he would come to me and said, if you ever need anything, just knock on my door and come see me. Just be honest with me and tell me if there's a problem. And lucky enough, I, there was only one time I ever went to see him was I wanted to go on holidays. Um, I had earned, I had done about four months of rehab and I'd earned a holiday. So I went to see him and was like, I want to go to Ibiza for two weeks with the lads. Um, just didn't go down well at the were time. You, were you still on crutches or? No, the crutches were gone. But um, like, it was, like, he left me go in the end. But that was that was good. Yeah, it was two weeks in Ibiza. Yeah, yeah, good times. Good you're, times. you're like this mentally, mentally, Steve. This is what I need right now. I really feel it with just speed things along. I'm, I'm really down, <laughs> yeah. Steve. I could just do getting away. I beat that. Don't worry about it. But you see, the thing is, the beauty of Steve Bruce is he's he's a huge family man. Mm. Um, like his wife Janet used to come to all the games or whatever. She had been, I think they were their childhood sweethearts, I think, like, and they've been together. I, I don't want to have it stagger off his age, but say 35, 40 years or something, they've been together. Um, so he's a very family oriented, oriented man. At that time, I was single. So I was just kind of like, he was like, oh, I was like, when I got to see him, I was like, I want to go to Spain. And he was like, oh, where are you going in Spain and that? And I was like, oh, I'm, I, just, I don't know, some island or something. And he was like, oh, Bjorka or one of them. Like, And he said, who are you going with? Have you, he, you don't have kids. And I was like, no, no, no kids. No, no, no. And he was like, who are you going with? And I was like, ah, one or two of the lads. And then it just kind of eventually he was like, right. 
cut the nonsense and tell me the truth. And I was like, look, uh, there's a few lads I know going to beat them. I want to go. Yeah. It was a bit. It was a bit longer, drawn out conversation than that quick, quick summary I gave you. But no, yeah. look, he was very good in that though. He he knew, um, he knew how to get the best out of players, and he was almost a, a father figure type. You know, a lot of people are quick to judge him on his tactics, and say like he's a dinosaur, he's this or he's that. But he, he's a very good man manager, um, and he always. If you look at those players, they play for him. If yeah. you look at, you know, even St. Maximum, the goal he scored against Burnley, who does he run to? He runs to the manager. Do you know, it's that kind of, he gets the best out of players. He takes lads on two, three levels. Yeah, it is funny how, like, I think the first match we ever did together was the Newcastle-Manchester United game, and you could tell straight away the warmth and affection you had for Steve Bruce. And you're right, people do think of him as that old-school dinosaur. And, Damien Delaney was talking to him recently about Sam Allardyce, and he loved Allardyce. Like, he loved Allardyce's attitude and the way Allardyce walked into a dressing room and really responded to that. And you're kind of going, really? Because like, Damien thinks about football in a very modern way. That Sam Allardyce would be your kind of guy. He's like, I just, he just got their dressing room. Like, he just got... And that's a very yeah. hard thing, I think, from the outside, when you haven't been in there, to appreciate that you often wonder of how these managers end up on the merry-go-round and they keep getting the big gigs. But I guess it's because... Steve Bruce, wherever he goes, within football circles, people always speak very highly of him. Yeah, of course. And that goes, I, I think I think if you look at his time at Hull, he was doing not only managing the squad, but he was, you know, taking care of so much stuff off the pitch as well that he kind of, if you looked at Newcastle right now, right, if you looked at before Steve took over when Rafa Benito was there, there was always these problems with Mike Ashley. Would would he give him the money to spend on players? Um, I think Rafa Benitez wanted to build this new extravagant training ground to take Newcastle onto level, which is fine. Mike Ashley, I, I don't know what happened. Might have been up in the air about it. Um, but then since Steve Bruce has come in now, there seems to be, there's not much said about Mike Ashley. Of course, you're going to have a few noisy Newcastle fans, but it has tapered right down that it's just, they're more concerned about the team, you know, and he has that unique ability. Even after that game, that was the first one I did with you and, you know, um, Matty Longstaff scored the winner against United. But even so, like, I find myself inside the manager's office after, like, with Steve, his assistants, um, Steve Agnew, Steve Clements, his wife, Janet, his daughter, Amy, and I'm having a drink and then, you know, I'm having a drink with them and next minute Ollie Gunnar Solskjaer walks in with Mick Phelan and they're chatting to you and it's just like, Jesus, I, I'm meant to be working here with off the ball. Like, yeah, and you were. And I was standing outside in the pissing rain for about 20 minutes while you were in having a great time. I was delighted for you. Well done. Uh, yeah, yeah, but the, the point the point is you were going to get a taxi to the airport, but I got Kieran Clark yeah, to yeah, drop yeah. you to the airport, so there is... There's some do you mean... name dropping here, bloody hell. <laughs> Here, we were meant to be talking about Liverpool at some stage. Uh, Fabinho stepped in last night. Mm. It seems from listening to Klopp that he's definitely not confident in the short term that Matip will be able to play two games in a week. Is this just going to be it? Joe Gomez will have to play week in, week out, and that it'll be one of Fabinho or Matip? Or do you think, actually, from listening to John Giles, he's been raving about Fabinho, do you think, actually, Fabinho, if he gets a run, can just play there every week alongside Joe Gomez? Yeah, well, I, I tweeted that last night. I think that Fabinho will be a cent and a half for Liverpool for till Virgil's back. Um I only will change if there's you know if they're if they're short in midfield that he'll have to go back into midfield. Um it's just the way he plays the game. He's very cultured, you know he, he's quite like he's very composed. He's quite sharp off the mark. So he just like he slotted in effortlessly in the sense that he was just relaxed, calm, just brings an assurance, you know, as as in when he's playing holding Midfielder. Look, after last night's performance, he became the second best, you know, centre half in the world after Virgil. Um, I know a lot of Liverpool fans were getting a bit, but I think he he can definitely do a job for Liverpool. And look, he didn't look out of place. He looked comfortable. You know, he can deal with the ball. You know, there will be different challenges that will face him in the Premier League and the Champions League with different strikers. You know. So it's definitely, definitely one that can do. And I think it will end up being him and Gomez. And I think if Matip if Matip gets fit, then he might just, you know, give him a rest or move him back into midfield. But he definitely, I think there's been a lot of negative criticism towards, like, Jurgen Klopp that he's not signed a centre-half after Lovren's left. But you can't, 
like hide and say it's a great thing. You can't come into the season thinking, oh, I'm going to lose my main mm. centre half here for the rest of the season. God, I should have signed a centre half three months ago. Like, look, you've got Matip, you've got um, Gomez, you've got Fabinho. We've seen Henderson do it in the Club World Cup. Um, albeit I wouldn't be a big fan of his playing centre half. Um, but and they've got the young boy, is it Rice Williams, who made his debut last night. So look, there is there is enough cover. Um and if if it becomes an issue when the transfer window opens, they will look to address it maybe with a loan or you know, a kind of a young upcoming centre half. A bit like if you look at Everton, they signed the the young boy Ben Godfrey, they'd yeah. they'd look they'd look at someone maybe like that one for the future that might have because of this injury, has forced their hand a little bit more. Well, they have to change the way they play because Liverpool play an incredibly high line, largely yeah. down to, you would think, to the brilliance of Van Dijk and the pace he has and so rarely caught out of position. Do you think that, as good as Fabinho has shown himself to be so far, that that would be too risky to play that high line without Van Dijk there? Yeah, definitely. Um, of course. Look, the, and does that the, not the change national... everything then, if they're not playing that high line? Does that not have an impact <sighs> further up the pitch? It, what I'm saying is it's not going to be as high it'll be five yards deeper because the natural instinct for Fabinho will be Virgil is so comfortable alongside Joe Gomez or Matt Hip or whatever because they're used to playing week in week out that they can draw the line off one another whereas I think Fabinho will just take those two three yards to kind of see the bigger picture and see everything that he won't he'll be aware of what's behind him what's the distance to Adrian or Alisson once he returns what's his What's the distance? Like if a ball's played down the side of me or over the top of me, he'll be he'll be finding his feet. But we saw it last night, or not last night, Tuesday night, um, in the sense that it was a lot deeper, you know, compared to where they used to. Well, not a lot deeper, a little mm. bit deeper, and they dealt with everything. Do you know what I mean? Of course, look, Ajax are are a very good team. Um, I think people underestimate them, but you know they were a good team and they did cause Liverpool problems. But every problem that they had, they dealt with. Just briefly, I know you. I think were you watching Manchester United as well on Tuesday night? Yeah, wait. No, I got my days wrong there, and I Liverpool played last. Liverpool night. were Manchester last night. United, United were Tuesday yeah. night. Uh, like, they got the job done against Newcastle. It was tough going, and then they finally got the rewards in the last ten minutes. And then, strange game against Paris Saint Germain. But Solskjaer has developed a brilliant ability that when the pressure is really on, when it feels mm. like they're on the verge of crisis, he pulls off a big win. It's to kick on again now. Like, is it is it going to be this never-ending cycle for United, or do you think actually the quality is there that they can push on and become a comfortable top four team and, and maybe contend in the Champions League with the sort of counter-attacking talents they have? I don't know if it'll be a mainstay in the top four. I still think they're they're off Liverpool and Man City's. You know, they're they're off. They're not they're not near them. Um, look, they definitely should be knocking on the door of the third and fourth place. But I think. With the performance on Tuesday night against PSG, I thought they were exceptional. Um, like, he made a huge call to leave Pogba out. And then, like, I think everybody was looking at the team kind of going, well, hold on a minute. What's he go What's he doing here? What's going on? Mm. Do you know, to play Fred McTominay, who was exceptional. Then you look at tons of white playing centre-half or the right of a three, whatever way you want to put it. He was exceptional. And even when... Even when PSG started to get a foothold in the game, he changed and then he brought Pogba on and changed back to a 4-3-3 and it's just the game opened up for them. Do you know, he took off Tellez and it was like, you have to give him the credit because they were, they were like, the whole performance from start to end was remarkable and, you know, they were fully deserved to win that game. Albeit, yes, Neymar um, and Mbappe weren't, showed huffs and puffs of their abilities. They weren't at the races 100%, but... United were full, you know, full on credit and fully deserved to win that game. And you know, it's. I think all Manchester United fans now would be just desperate for them to kind of get on a run and maintain that. Because as you said, is this going to be it? That is he going to have a huge moment and then come down again, and then it looks like he's under a bit of pressure, and then have another huge win. You just kind of you want to see them kick on and do well. And certainly, you know, can they put a run of games together? That's the big thing. Mm. Big old decision to drop Pogba. Yeah, well, if you're not pulling your weight, you don't deserve to play, mm. albeit whoever you are, you know. Um, a lot of people have had different reasoning. Um, you know, if you look at the thing when his international duty comes out talking about Madrid, I know in the past he had COVID and he recovered from it, that maybe he wasn't up to match fitness, but he's not played to the level Paul Pogba can play at. You know, that's just that's just the way, and you can't, you can't carry passengers in your team. There's no doubting he's an exceptional footballer. He is world-class. 
you know, whether you're a Manchester United fan, you don't like him, you disagree with me, whether you Manchester City, Liverpool, you try and trace him around. He's six foot three, he's big, he's strong, he's very skillful. He's no problem facing you up and taking you one. He can go on his right, he can go on his left. He has every attribute. I don't know what it is with him. You know, I, I would love to have had his ability. I'd have probably played for Barcelona. Um, but at the same time, he's not he's not doing it. He's showing glimpses of it. Of it. Like he came on the other night. I think the system changed the game, but he certainly contributed to it. And he played like the Paul Pogba we know yeah. he can play. You know, but he's got to be able to find that level of consistency. Yeah, uh, and Chelsea for Manchester United at the weekend, David. Great stuff. Uh, we get into again just how quickly after Virgil Van Dijk became the best defender in the world, did your agent stop taking your calls? He just didn't need you anymore. He had the main. Oh, no, 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 no. They no, still, no. They we, still we, take my calls. We, we get into that. We get into that another time. David, great stuff as always. Take it easy. All right. Thanks, Nathan. Quick break, and we're going to talk to Shane Keegan about a disappointing night for Dundalk. Football on Off The Ball With Paddy Power New normal, same old football Paddy Power Gamble responsibly, gamblingcare.ie At Leia Healthcare we always want to give our members more So now you get unrestricted access to a world of benefits that will help you stay healthy From convenient video calls with a GP to get prescriptions online To easy access to experts When you finally want to do something about your ropey knee or dodgy back and if you do need to see someone urgently, our clinics are available for minor injuries, all without you needing to put your hand in your pocket. Let's stay on top of your health in every way. Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Insurance provided by Ellipse Insurance Limited Trading as Leia Healthcare. Leia Healthcare Limited Trading as Leia Healthcare and Leia Life is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Unrestricted benefits are available until the end of December. Fair usage policy applies. The COVID-19 Adaptation Fund of €26 million Euro is there to support tourism and hospitality businesses adapt their premises or operations to meet safety guidelines. For example, if you've created an outdoor seating space or installed protective screens and sanitising stations, you may be eligible to receive between €515,000. The deadline has been extended. You now have until the 31st of October to complete your application. Visit fallchairireland.ie to check if your business is eligible. An initiative of Falcha Ireland and the Government of Ireland. Strange times, we say. They certainly are. But we take heart from the spirit people are showing. Looking out for neighbours thinking about what really matters. And right now, around the country, good people are working to produce great tasting Irish food brands. Local products you can really trust. So when you shop, you can support thousands of Irish jobs and businesses by looking for the Love Irish Food heart. So next time you're shopping, have a heart. Love Irish Food. Whatever your business needs, we have your van. The Opel Commercial Vehicles range gets the job done effectively, effortlessly, and with the efficiency of a pro. High-tech connectivity, high-volume payloads, and unrivaled comfort and safety. The Opel Commercial range suits any business. Discover more about the Movano, Vivaro, or Combo Cargo, Continental Tires Irish Van of the Year 2020, at your local Opel dealer. We have your van. See opel.ie for details. That's the sound of Brian. After purchasing his brand new smartphone at Harvey Norman, he said goodbye to long expensive phone contracts by going SIM free. Buying a new smartphone shouldn't break the bank. And at Harvey Norman, we have the biggest brands and the largest range of SIM free phones with smartphones from just €89. Euro. And with no long term contract to sign up to, you're in charge. SIM free smartphones at Harvey Norman. Break free and take charge of your phone. This October, watch the big games every weekend with Sky Sports and Sports Extra Half Price. This week, it's Man United Chelsea live only on Sky Sports. Rashford, Martial! In a star-studded clash. Mason Mount. Get Sky Sports, BT Sport and Premier Sports half price for six months. Search Sky Sports Sale. New sports customers only. Standard pricing applies after six months or if cancelling one element of the bundle. Minimum term and further terms apply. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. Minimal contact in stadiums? Shouldn't stop the usual suspects from going down. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie Welcome back to Thursday's football show. Celtic have pulled a goal back against AC Milan, Mohamed Ali and Nusi, but they still trail 2-1. There are seven minutes left in that game in the Europa League. Leicester City 3-0 up 
against Zoria Kelechi Iheanacho adding to the goals from Madison and Barnes and Spurs in their game 2-0 up still against Lask a goal from Lucas Moura and an own goal there in the 8 o'clock kickoffs earlier in the 6 o'clock games there was a victory for Rangers 2-0 away at Standard Liège Arsenal came from behind to beat Rapid Vienna 2-1 in Group B and also in Group B Dundalk beaten 2-1 at Tallis Stadium having gone in front in the first half in that game up against Molde and the Norwegian side came back to win it in the second half let's hear from the Dundalk manager Filippo Givagnoli from this thing is coming uh, our my disappointment because we couldn't consolidate the ball we couldn't uh, when we were gaining we dropped too much uh, we left them command the game too much. Um, so this is, the, this is the thing that we have to improve, especially in the European game. We can't give the opponent the complete control of the game, or even if you are up 1-0, because then opportunity, they're going to create opportunity. Then in Europe, if they create opportunity, then they score. Do you think you'll learn much from tonight? It was obviously new territory for you. Do you, like, do you think you'll learn valuable lessons from this? Yes, of course, of course. Of course, we have to learn and we have to learn fast uh, the lesson because games are coming every three days. So we will need to, to learn from this really, really fast, prepare and be prepared for the, for the next. But now the focus is going to waterfall. We have another game in three days. So this is our schedule. And, and I know that it's not the best schedule to play games in Europe because before Molde we had three games and three important league games for us. So it's not the best way to prepare, to prepare games against these giant European teams. Uh, but it is what it is. I always say it is what it is. We have, this is what we have, and we have to be strong and and keep on going to work and try to try to improve. Yeah, that is the Dundalk manager Filippo Giovanioli talking after their two-one defeat against Mold. I'm delighted that Dundalk coach Shane Keegan has joined us on the line as well. Evening, Shane. How are you going, Nate? How are you? Mm -hmm. Cheered up a little bit there by uh, David Miner's Abita story. All right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how the other la la uh, the other side lived their lives. Jeez, uh, it looked so good for so long, and after a really positive forty-five minutes, I, I think the manager summed it up. It just seemed as though Dundalk started sitting deeper and deeper, and it felt almost inevitable. It's easy to say now, but in hindsight, do you feel you could have done something to stop the flow? Yeah, look, it certainly wasn't by choice, Nathan, that we ended up deeper and deeper. That's for sure. Um, Look, they're a really, really quality side. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And, and you know, they obviously got a, a bit of a tongue lashing at half time. And I suppose that first 20 minutes of the second half, we just, it was a constant onslaught, wasn't it? It really, really was a constant onslaught. We, we couldn't get a hold of it. And, and to be fair, any time we were getting a hold of it, probably nine of our 10 outfield players, with the exception of Pat Hoban, were all inside the, the defensive 25% of the field. Um, so really, really hard to find a, a, an outfall under circumstances like that. And, you know, like, look, it's a mixture of could we have done a bit better? We could. I'm sure we could, to be fair. But as I said, their quality was very, very high as well. And look, I, I know it's kind of impossible to, to try and make this point without sounding like you're making excuses. But I think what you saw in the second half as well is the difference that 48 hours recovery makes. Mm. Um, they played on Saturday night. Obviously, we didn't play on until Monday night. Am I right in saying um, that Dundalk, we Dundalk were the only team in the whole Europa League that played on Monday night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look, it was it was it was very very frustrating to have to go through that. I mean, there's there's times there's times, Nathan, where we have to play an extra game because we have had that game postponed earlier due to Europa League commitments. But we're going to have this. We had this scenario with Derry because Derry had so many players in the international squad. We're going to have it later in the season with St. Pat's because the game had to be called off, obviously, because they had a couple of COVID cases. So it's even more frustrating. And I don't know what the solution is, but it is even more frustrating when you've got these extra games before big European games through kind of no fault of your own almost. But look, that said, they, they were a quality, quality side. And when they turned the screw on us, they really did turn the screw, you know. When you look at the 90 minutes as a whole and the preparation you put in, like the game plan that you set out, did the team implement that? Yeah, look, I, I 
honestly think for two thirds of the game um, we, we couldn't have asked any more the first 45 and the last 15 we really really couldn't have asked for any more now look as I say granted we were we were real well well second best for that probably the whole first 30 minutes of, of the second half but by and large the lads did terrifically they really really did um, look we had identified that we thought there might be a weakness down the sides a little bit we'd also identified that, that we thought they might struggle to, to defend the crosses it's not something they have to do a huge amount of um, and obviously that's where, where our, our goal came from an absolutely fantastic cross from, from John Mount mm. I mean Filippo's had a few tough calls to make there in terms of personnel you know he's gone with somebody like John Mountney because he thinks he has a very good delivery of a ball and I mean that's you know where, where kind of tight calls like that and making the right decision really really pays off for you so in a lot of aspects, I thought we, we did fantastically well. And even the last 15, you know, we really, really threw up everything at it. And I thought we had a couple of half chances. Yeah. The lack of crowds, is, do you feel that that's a factor? Like, this would have been such a big occasion in Tala. Stadium would have been packed. It may well have been forced to be in the Viva Stadium. And you would have had 30,000 people at this game. And when you get that lead, the noise and the momentum and the energy it brings, like, that wasn't there. It, it all just felt a bit flat, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and you say when you get the goal, I'd say even more so, you know, you talk about the tiredness and, and there was obvious tiredness kind of 10, 15 minutes into the second half and, and Filippo himself has spoken about how maybe we just didn't quite get the changes made at, at, at the right time. But when you're, when you're absolutely flat out and you've got no energy, um, players will tell you that, that, you know, having that, as you say, 30,000 roaring yawn, it, you know, you know, you know that feeling when the opposition have had a chance and they've missed it and, and the home support kind of give you that kind of a G up of okay lads mm. we've got away with that but let's you know let's rise it again kind of a thing and, and, and that can work that does give you an extra maybe boost of energy levels that 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 can keep you going for another five or ten minutes and to not have that is is disappointing but sure look you know there's absolutely uh, nothing in the world anybody can do about that really yeah N Filippo was talking about not being able to be in the technical area not being able to be properly in the dugout just having to stand behind it didn't seem like he was that far away but his frustration it, 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 is that a factor like do you feel it's it's more difficult for the management team to interact to to properly get a sense of what you want to do while the game is going on yeah, I, I don't think it impacted really on, on the changes. The changes, I, I've been guilty myself as a manager of, of, you know, not getting changes done quick enough. And quite often it's that you know who you want to bring on. You've just got so much quality on the field, you're struggling to figure out who exactly you're going, who exactly you want to take off, really. Um, in terms of the whole thing with, with, with Filippo not being allowed out on the sideline and, and to the front of the technical area and that, like I, I, I know if I was in his position, it would feel like I'd have one arm chopped off. It really, really would. It must be incredibly, incredibly frustrating for him. Um, and all I can do is try and, and, and act as the best conduit I possibly can and the best go-between I can, you know, can, constantly glancing behind him and, and just making eye contact so that he can call me at any time that he wants to try and, and, and feed something out there. But no matter no matter what I try and do and as best as I do it for him, it's not the same as him being on, standing on the sideline. It, 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 there's a, there is definitely a, a certain... Uh, helplessness that he has to feel that I know I would certainly feel if, if, if I was in his shoes, you know. You touched on where you'd identified some of maybe the, the weaknesses and the opportunities in the mould aside down the wings and susceptible to crosses. When you're putting together a game plan for a step up in quality of opposition, like, was there more of a focus on the opposition than there ordinarily would be? Well, there's more of a focus on the opposition for the simple fact that in my role, where that's, I suppose, primarily my role is looking at opposition teams, I mean, you you know, I am fully aware that within the League of Ireland, sure, most of the players know all the opposition players inside out and they know the opposition teams inside out and there's very, very little new that I can give them. Whereas leading into a game like this, it's a far, far more relevant role, relevant role because, I mean, you know, it's only probably seven days ago that our lads literally do, knew absolutely nothing about Mould as a team or, or the individuals within that team. Whereas... I like to think that by the time they walk out onto the field today, they knew absolutely everything that they needed to know. Now, knowing it and being able to stop it are two very, very, very different things. I mean, you know, the dog in the street seemed to know that, that, that Wolf Ackerman was, was their best player. Um, and I think we did reasonably well to try and deal with him. But at the same time, oh my God, I thought his quality was, was just unbelievable. Though I'd say I'd be interested in looking at that tomorrow. I'd say the man must have finished with near enough 100% pass completion. Mm. He's, he's, 
he was incredible. But we knew that and we planned for that. And and I do think we limit him him to a certain extent. But did you plan? Same, did you plan for him to have a hundred percent pass completion, or was it just ensuring that the hundred percent pass completion <laughs> was in the, in the right part of the pitch? <laughs> yeah, well, I know. Yeah, look, it's 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 yeah. That is, you're you're trying to say right. I mean, Philippe has a great phrase there about uh, what, I can't remember what way he phrased it, but but if the blanket doesn't cover the whole body, you have to decide does the blanket <laughs> cover the top part of the body or the bottom part of the body, and that's it. It's it's you can't possibly stop this guy or you can't possibly stop everything yeah. more to have. So you have to try and decide right. Well, these are the bits we'll focus on, knowing that it'll give them a bit more in this area. But they're the choices you have to make when you're against such quality, you know. You've another busy week down in Waterford, as Felipe touched on there uh, on Sunday, and then you go to the Emirates this night next week, uh, Dundalk against Arsenal. Like, can you just not wait to get there, or like, is there a touch of nervousness of like we know how devastating Arsenal can be? Yeah, look, it, it, it's going to be brilliant, but unfortunately, the hecticness of the schedule is that you you genuinely can't look past Sunday. You just can't look past Sunday because we're we're not guaranteed Europa League for next year yet, um, and. To be fair, I think kind of, you know, all talk of Arsenal is ju is just pretty much banned until we get back in, on the bus after Sunday's game. I mean, our regular routine now is play uh, day one, play day two, recover day three, train day four, play, and it's just that constant, constant loop. Uh, well, um, what what sort of training get... session is that? Like, is that that is that just going through the motions and setting up tactically? Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's all you can do. Look, there'll be, you know, those who haven't played kind of 60 minutes or more will be able to do a little bit more work. But by and large, it's coaching through mouth and coaching through vision rather than coaching through energy. You're, you're trying to explain situations, walk players through situations, um, you know, have a little look at set pieces, different things like that. But, like, it's really, really, really limited what you can do. Obviously, really, really limited. Um and look, that does have an impact again. But I thought, you know, I thought in fairness to Filippo and Giuseppe, I think they did manage to tick most boxes that we needed to in yeah. terms of, of trying to be prepared for tonight. Yeah, look, and as you said, there were good quality opposition and the margins were pretty tight in the end. Are you going to have the Spurs jersey on underneath the Dundalk top at the Emirates? <laughs> very possibly, very possibly. Yeah. Hey, listen, it could have been a whole lot worse, Nathan. How was I going to cover the Celtic tattoo if we'd drawn Rangers? <laughs> Listen, I'll do your job for you. There's this guy called Aubameyang. Just make sure they don't let him come inside on his right foot. That's all you got to do. Nathan, you're about do... the fifth person to say that to me. God so, yeah. damn it. God. <laughs> if that happens now, you're getting fired. Here, Shane, hard luck tonight. Look, look, looking at their lineup, I thought they'd have a hell of a lot more weak inside out. That was some side they put out tonight. So, yeah, it uh, certainly was. Yeah. And uh, they, got, they just about got the job done as well. So uh, Rapid Vienna clearly aren't any pushovers either. But listen here, it's obviously going to be a great experience in many ways. But you want the results as well. So I'm sure no doubt there's a lot of disappointment in that dressing room. But Shane, you're great as always to take the call. Cheers, no problem, Ned. Shane Keegan there after Dundalk's 2-1 defeat against Mulder. Celtic, by the way, beaten 3-1 by AC Milan in their game. Football on Off The Ball With Paddy Power New normal, same old football Paddy Power Gamble responsibly, gamblingcare.ie From the apartment in the city to the cottage in the country At Energia, we're the power behind a quarter of a million customers across Ireland And right now, there's never been a better time to join us And save on your electricity and gas with our cheapest dual fuel bundle Wherever you're living, know you always get the biggest savings by coming direct to us. Go direct to energia.ie and switch today. Energia, the power behind your savings. EAB €1,413 Euro based on average annual usage, 12-month contract, discount to unit rates, standing charge, PSO levy and carbon tax, T's and C's and early termination fee apply. Valid from October 2020 and subject to change. Verification in T's and C's at energia.ie forward slash EAB. It's flu season and while anyone can catch the flu, it can cause serious illness in children. The flu virus spreads easily from person to person. That's why children aged 2 to 12 can now get a free flu vaccine. It's given through a nasal spray and provides safe and effective protection from the flu. So don't delay. Book a free appointment with your GP or pharmacist and protect your family from the flu this winter. Visit hse.ie forward slash flu for more information. From the HSE. 
At Centra, we have everything you need for the long weekend. Like Inspired by Centra, Fresh Irish Angus, Trip Loin Steak, 1454 gram, only €7.50. Euro 7 Up and Club Orange 18 can packs, only €10 euro each. And until Monday, Trevento Reserve Malbec and Torres Venusol Wine, two for €15. Euro. Centra, live every day. Enjoy those sensibly. That's the sound of Brian banking the money he saved by going SIM-free at Harvey Norman. Buying a new smartphone shouldn't break the bank. Mobile network providers sell smartphones with long and expensive contracts. Contracts you're locked into for up to two years. At Harvey Norman, we have the biggest brands and the largest range of SIM-free phones with smartphones from just €89. Euro. And with no long-term contract to sign up to, you're in charge. SIM-free smartphones at Harvey Norman. Break free and take charge of your phone. Little Woods Ireland has all the toys that your kids are dreaming about. Our online store is fully stocked with this year's most wanted brands. From board games to sports cars, gaming consoles and dolls. Shop from the comfort of your home and don't miss out on the toys they really want. Brands you love, delivered at littlewoodsireland.ie. We all need to keep an eye out for one another during COVID-19, especially our older and more vulnerable neighbours. Making sure no one feels overlooked during these tough times alone is doing important work helping older people across Ireland experiencing loneliness, ill health or poverty. But in order to keep helping, they need yours now. Please visit alone.ie forward slash donate. Together, we can celebrate and connect older people in our communities with alone. Supported by Guinness. Always drink responsibly. Visit drinkaware.ie. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. Minimal contact in stadiums? Shouldn't stop the usual suspects from going down. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie. There'll be plenty more reaction to Dundalk's defeat on OTBAM from half seven tomorrow morning with Adrian and Owen. They're also going to be talking to Rodrigo and Gabriella about their new song with Pele. They'll have tip star Paulie Maher on the show. Alan Quinn and looking ahead to the Six Nations clash with Italy and Kathleen McNamee previewing Ukraine against Ireland. We're back in the radio from 7 tomorrow night. That Ireland-Ukraine game will have just gone full time, so we'll have all the reaction and analysis from that. We'll also bring you part two of our exclusive chat with Rob Carney, where he's going to be joined by his good friend Brian O'Driscoll. Uh, so that will be from 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Gordon Elliott on Friday Night Racing as well, so a brilliant show from 7 tomorrow. Tom Dunn is up next. We'll talk to you then. Good luck. Get my ball and he out of ground.